This is Dr. Jason W. Morrison, Theologist, New South Wales, Australia. The time is 1.10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, I'm going to be starting now the Galatians chapter 3. Oh, hang on to your horses. This is going to be very interesting. We'll let the, we're using the JW.org um, platform, <clears throat> just to be fair to the Jehovah Witnesses. And we're going to start, we've done one and two, now let's begin chapter three. Now this is a very powerful chapter. It's going to completely unravel all Jehovah Witness work doctrines. Um, in fact, it's frightening when you think about what Paul says in here. Oh, senseless Jehovah Witnesses, it should say. It even should say in some cases, oh, senseless Christians. But let's see how we go. Here we go. Chapter three. Oh, senseless Galatians. Now, see the way he said that? That's given it the sound that it actually deserves. Who has brought you under this evil influence? Now, listen for a minute. The evil influence is anything you think you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. You've got to get this in your mind. There's nothing you can do besides what Jesus Christ has done for you to make God happy or stop him from being sad. People won't have it because they want to do their bit for God. Oh, I've got to do this, I've got to do... There's nothing you can do for your salvation. If you're standing out at the carts or whatever, it's all voluntary. It's not impressing God. It's not giving you some kind of favor with God. You have all the favor you want in Christ Jesus. That's just voluntary. That's how you're choosing to use your, your time. Now... <clears throat> If you think you're impressing God by what you do, you're a senseless Galatian. You're senseless. You've got no sense of, of what has happened for you or what Jesus has done for you. You're walking around senseless, thinking that you're making God happy or stopping from being sad. You're actually just wasting your time. I'm sorry, but that's the bottom line of it. Where you spend your time is up to you. How you voluntarily choose to spend your time is up to you, but don't think God's impressed by it, because he's not. You who had Jesus Christ openly portrayed before you as nailed to the stake. This one thing... I... Now, the thing there is, um, you had Jesus Christ openly portrayed to you as nailed to the stake. Now, nailed to the stake's crucified. Why couldn't they have just put in crucified? Because they have to be exclusive, don't they? Well, what it's talking about is you had the finished work of Christ given to you. You received it. It was, it was in your hands. Now, who's brought this evil influence on you to think there's something more than that that you need to do? Wow. I want to ask you, did you receive the Spirit through works of law or because of faith in what you heard? Now, I'm going to ask you this, right? <clears throat> By faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been given the Holy Spirit. Whether you want it or not, whether you believe it or not, the Holy Spirit's dwelling in you. That's it, final. It's not an argument. It's not something that's, you know, they, the Pentecostals and Charismatics spend most of their time convincing themselves on the levels of the power of the Holy Spirit that they have and all this. Well, he's there. Whether you acknowledge it or not, or agree with it or not, the Holy Spirit is there. He's with you. But, <clears throat> the question is, did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law, by the things you think you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, or by the hearing of faith, or by the hearing of of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that your sins are forgiven for time and eternity through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I can tell you right now, you received the Holy Spirit through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's a gift. He is not something you can earn, nor is salvation, nor is anything else to do with this. Let's carry on, shall we? Are you so senseless? After starting on a spiritual course, are you finishing on a fleshly course? Now, this is where the Jehovah Witnesses really fall over because they do not admit and do not want to believe that they have a spirit. But that's going to bring them terribly undone. 
because when their spirit leaves their body and they're wondering what's going on, right, how can I still be here? Because they are going to still be there. That's just a consequence of being given life. I don't know why they don't expect accept it. The difference is, and this is the difference, you have a spiritual aspect that comes into Christ and you have a, a sinful nature inside you that needs to have you doing things that you think you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad to be empowered. Romans chapter 7 tells you that. So there is a part of us, an internal, it's called fleshly here, but it's your sinful nature, right? It's your sinful nature. Your, the fleshly course basically here is whatever you think you need to do to make God happy or stop him from being sad within your mind, you think you're impressing God and you're stopping him from... That is a fleshly course. That is the course that's going to cause you to produce the fruit of the flesh, which is adultery and all this child abuse and stuff. <clears throat> that's why works for righteousness cannot work, will not work, never have worked, and they are never going to work. And he's saying, you started on a fleshly course, you believed in what Christ did, and now you're all over the place thinking you can impress God. Did you undergo so many sufferings for nothing? If it really was for nothing. Now the sufferings here, and I want to make this clear, are primarily directed towards the Jewish believers in Galatia. Because they were coming under fire for not adhering to the law. And if you put the Gentiles in the mix, they were probably coming under fire because they weren't carrying on with the pagan beliefs that they had in Galatia. But the primary thing here is they, the Messianic believers were coming under such fire from moving into Christ and, and abandoning the law. Um, this is, see, this isn't, this is the sort of persecution that we're talking about. Um, there's also a Christian application, just being a Christian in those times they were persecuted, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about, have you suffered so many things for nothing, if indeed it really was for nothing? In other words, you've moved across to Christ, and now you're going back to these pagan... See, thinking there's something you can do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad actually is pagan. Because it's no different to offering a sacrifice of of a goat or an animal on a on an altar trying to make God happy or stop him from being sad. A mindset doesn't have to be a physical thing. A mindset's a thing that activates your sinful nature. If you think you're impressing God or stopping him, you've really got to understand this. There's no way you can impact God influentially by the things that you do. He'll do through you what he chooses to not by what you do to try and influence him to do it. For salvation. I'm not talking about miracles and open prisoning, opening prison doors and all this other stuff that he does, bringing back people to life. I'm talking about your salvation. <clears throat> Let's carry on, shall we? Therefore, does the one who supplies you the Spirit and performs powerful works among you do it because of your works of law? Or because of your faith in what you heard? Now listen here, they've changed this. Powerful, powerful works is miracles. Can I look at this cross-reference? Oh, it doesn't mean anything, does it? Powerful works means miracles, actual real-life miracles, which means miracles were happening after Jesus went to the cross. Therefore, he who does... Therefore, does he who supplies you the Spirit and performs, performs powerful works or miracles among you do it because of your works or because of your faith? Well, we, we know the answer. It, nothing is because of our works. It's because of our faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, wow. You can't beat the scripture. You just can't beat the scripture. You can try, but you'll never out. They've tried to change it and they've tried to, you know, maladjust it and make it suit their thing, but you can't. You just can't beat the just scripture. Just as Abraham put faith in Jehovah 
and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, now this is really interesting because Abraham gets, you know, he's the father of the faith and all this, but he was a wretched man. Abraham was a wretched man. He gave his wife to some bloke that um, he told was his sister. Um, and the guy had, the Lord confronted the guy and had to bring her back. And he got angry at Abraham saying, what do you think you're doing, mate? You could have got me killed. Um, he slept with his servant because his wife told him to. Um, and a lot of, I just want to say, some religious people use that as an excuse to sleep with somebody else. Some people get their cheap frills out of swapping and changing, I'm telling you, and it's, and it's not of God. And then they'll let people die for not having a blood transfusion. Goodness gracious, come on. But don't think Abraham's um, just here where <clears throat> he put faith in his, uh, Jehovah. It had anything to do with his works. This is Paul's whole point. Abraham was a wretched man. So was David. So... Don't get muddled up thinking that these guys were doing something that you, more than what you were. These guys were doing worse probably than what you are. <clears throat> and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Surely you know that it is those who adhere to faith who are sons of Abraham. Now the scripture, foreseeing that God would declare people of the nations righteous through faith, declared the good news beforehand to Abraham. Namely, by means of you, all the nations will be blessed. So those who adhere to faith are being blessed together with Abraham, who, who had faith. Now, I just want to point out here. <clears throat> sorry. Um, now, now, the scripture foreseeing that God would declare people of the nations righteous through faith declared the good news beforehand to Abraham. Beforehand. Now, this is before the law. It's before the Messianic law. Okay, so there's a lot of voluntary, a lot of relationships going on with God that were voluntary, but just directed in the right direction. Not behavior. All those who depend on works of law are under a curse. Anything you think you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad has got you under a curse. Now, what curse is that? Now, let's stop for a minute. What curse is Paul talking about here? He's talking about the curse of Romans chapter 7. Whenever, however, whatever you think you need to do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, you are arousing your sinful nature. You are putting into action your sinful nature. Now, I'm going to go to Romans 7. So we go up to our chapter selection. We choose Romans. Showing you how to use these things. Romans uh, 7. And you can use any part of Romans 7. It's right through it. Um, this part's a little bit technical. What he was trying to do in the first part of Romans chapter 7 is help, again, the Jewish believers who still thought they needed to stay under the law he was trying to help them in their conscience to be able to let go, to be able to realize in their conscience that it's okay to let the law, the law go now and what you were giving to the law, let Christ have. Just let it, just breathe it out, as it were, and let Christ take over. It's no longer anything you have to do. The law's dead. Now let Christ look after you. That was the first part of Romans chapter 7. But even in that part, I'm sure, um, here in verse 4, we start to get really intense. And it's interesting because, again, the Jehovah Witnesses, the people that tried to translate this and suit their doctrines, just couldn't. There was too much coming at them to really do it properly. So it says in verse 5, for when we were living according to the flesh, now viewers, what's according to the flesh? It's not your body. Okay, I want to make this clear. It's not your physical human body because your physical human body is a neutral instrument. And it's up to your wisdom or foolishness on how you're going to play it. What you're going to do with it. 
But what Paul's trying to do here is show you that there's a power working within you that will cause you to use your instrument, your human body, the wrong way. Because when you, they, these Messianic believers were living under the law, and just let me say, we are not under the law. We will ne if you're not a Jew, you are never under the law. If you are a Jew, well, if you believe in Christ, you don't need to. Well, what that immediately makes people think is, well, you're saying you can do whatever you want. No, I'm not. I'm saying your salvation is not based on law. And if it is, all you're going to do, as this says, is the sinful passions that were awakened, you're just going to awaken. And this is where all religious trouble comes from. You're just going to awaken your sinful passions by the things you think you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. And you're just going to produce fruit to death. That's all you people are doing. That is all you are doing. And that's all you'll ever be able to do. While ever you think there's something you can do or not do. Under your laws and rules. To make God happy. Or stop him from being sad. Well that's only one part. Uh, Dr. Morrison that says that. Well is it? Okay then. <clears throat> Verse 8. But sin finding opportunity. How? But sin. This is your sinful nature. Finding opportunity afforded by what? If you want to afford sin an opportunity to take over you, think that there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. It's so black and white. Oh, that's only two verses. Well, what about three strikes and you're out? For sin finding opportunity afforded by what? By the things you think you have to do and not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. I keep saying it and saying it and saying it because it's the only way it can really and simply, as simply as I can theologically put it or, or in common language. I'm, sin finds opportunity and affords itself over you via the things we think we need to do or not do. It will seduce you. It will seduce your mind. Your mind is not strong enough to combat the force of our sinful nature, particularly if you're unconsciously empowering it by thinking you're doing religious deeds and impressing God or not making him happy or stopping him from being sad. I'm sure some of my viewers are starting to get this by now. See, it's not the law. The law itself is holy, but we aren't. We have a sinful nature that needs the law to get its power and cause us to be evil. Oh, that's three verses. That's all you, you know, that's, that's not enough. Well, okay. Sin, that it might be shown sin, worked out death through what is good. What was good? The law. What was sin? The sinful nature in us. It's not actually us. It's just the sinful nature in us. You know, we've got a lot of people running around trying to be as holy as they can. But they don't realize a lot of their good works, um, if it's done out of the wrong motive, if it's just solely not voluntary, right? I'm not talking about voluntary work. I'm talking about things you think you actually need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. You're actually just making yourself more sinful. But sin did that it might be shown to be sin working out death in me through what is good, which is the law, so that through the commandment, sin might become far more sinful. So if you want to become far more sinful, just keep following your religious rules for righteousness, and that's exactly where you're going to end up, and that's exactly why a lot of good intending religious people are in trouble all over the world, and stand there and go, I don't know how that happened. Well, if you've watched this video, you do know how it happened, and we'll go back to Galatians chapter 3. Okay, so where were we? Gee whiz, where, oh, we were down here, weren't we? So let's see if we can find this thing and get it to where we want it. There, there, hang on. There, a little bit further. Oh, why don't we just start from there? there. Righteousness. Surely you know that it is those who adhere to faith who are sons of Abraham. Now the scripture, foreseeing that God would declare people of the nations righteous through faith, 
declared the good news beforehand to Abraham, namely, by means of you all the nations will be blessed. So those who adhere to faith are being blessed together with Abraham who had faith. See, <clears throat> it wasn't Abraham's person or works or anything. He just had faith in, in God. He had faith in the Lord. It had nothing to do with these good works or bad works and all this other stuff. It was his faith. This is where we get all muddled up. All those who depend on works of law are under a curse. So what are your laws that are cursing you? We've just found out what the curse is. It's your sinful nature being activated by your good little deeds that you think you need to do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, which is totally a different entity to just voluntary works out of gratefulness. Oh, deep inside everybody, there's that little part that's got that, oh, am I making him happy or stopping him from being sad? Let's not kid ourselves. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not remain in all the things written in the scroll of the law by doing them. So what he's saying there is, if you take this way of thinking that there's something you can do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, you have to do it 24-7 for the rest of your life and you can't do it. Moreover, it is evident that by law no one is declared righteous with God. No one has been, ever will be, or can be declared righteous before God by the things they think they need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. And they're definitely not going to be able to do that under the law because nobody can keep the law. Because the law is not, not of faith. Because the righteous one will live by reason of faith. Now the law is not based on faith. Your little rules for righteousness are not based on faith. They're based on something else. Pride even. Uh, pride and all this other stuff can cause you to think that there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. But it's definitely not based on faith. And you need to be aware of that and you need to be delivered of that. You need to come to that place where you realize that what Christ has done is enough for you. Rather, anyone who does these things will live by means of them. Christ purchased us, releasing us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse instead of us. Did you know that when Jesus died on the cross, all the penalties that were due to man as a result of the, the law that man couldn't keep, he took that punishment on the cross. That's how he released us. That's how he purchased us from thinking that there's things we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. Because it is written, Accursed is every man hung upon a stake. This was so that the blessing of Abraham would come to the nations by means of Christ Jesus, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through our faith. So you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who was promised by believing in what Jesus did when he, when he lived and died and was buried and rose again for the forgiveness of your sins. Your sins have been forgiven for time and eternity. You're at peace with God now. It's okay. No more sacrifices have to be offered. No more things have to be done. Nothing else. Oh, what about the hall? What about setting up the chairs? What about all this other stuff? Oh, God, I've got to go out and do the carts. I've got to go do this. No, that's voluntary. It's not impressing Jehovah or anybody else at all. It's like somebody offers up an animal on an altar in the back of the um, Middle East. They're, nobody's noticing that except the people that are standing there making a mess. Brothers, I speak using a human illustration. Once a covenant is validated, even if only by a man, no one annuls it or attaches additions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to your descendants, in the sense of many. Rather, it says, and to your offspring, in the sense of one, who is Christ. Now, what he's going to do is, go into the argument that Christ came through Isaac, not Ishmael. Now Ishmael was the son that was born to Abraham's 
servant, Hagar, under his instruction to sleep with her via Sarah, who couldn't have a child, and she wouldn't wait. But Sarah did become pregnant and had Isaac. And here, Paul's going to go into the argument that Christ came down from the lineage of Isaac. And this is why there's a lot of trouble in the Middle East, because the Arabs say he came through Hagar. But the Jews believe and know that he came through Isaac. Further, I say this. The law, which came into being 430 years later, does not invalidate the covenant previously made by God, so as to abolish the promise. For if the inheritance... So what he's saying is, just because the law came, it didn't abolish the promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis, I'm pretty sure, chapter 12. Um, the law didn't abolish that, okay? It didn't change that. The promise was never going to come through the law. Inheritance is based on law. It is no longer based on a promise. But God has kindly given it to Abraham through a promise. Why then? So basically, viewers, that means that Jesus Christ had no... Um, his coming had no significance or, or motivation via the law. It was motivated by the promise given to Abraham by God himself. Gee, that was cruel. And the law. the law. It was added to make transgressions manifest. Now, that's a very important um, statement there. The law was added to make transgressions manifest. That means that when you try and keep the law, guess what's going to manifest? Just what? It doesn't look like it on the surface, but guess what's going on and underneath? Sin is starting to manifest. Sin is starting to re revive. Romans 7, sin is starting to be aroused. Somebody's going to get hurt. Because the laws and rules for righteousness and the things we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad are just going to make transgressions manifest. I'm giving you the answer to these religious problems. Wow. Until the offspring should arrive to whom the promise had been made, and it was transmitted through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now... All the law did was show that sin will get worse if you try and make God happy or stop him from being sad. That's all it was there for. It was going to just try and... See, by the time Jesus came, the Pharisees, although they were unable to because their sinful nature needed the law to keep itself empowered, by the time Jesus came, and this was all part of God's plan, and this is why he's got a special place for the Jews, by the time Jesus came, you thought the Jews would have said, Thank God you're here. We can't do this. We've had enough. There's blood and guts from sacrifices everywhere. We can't keep up. We keep falling. We keep sinning. And we don't know why. Well, they did find out why in the end. It was the law itself that was causing them to sin. They had no chance. They had no chance. It was a horrible thing, really, when you think about it, to do to those people. It really was, my gosh. Now there is no mediator when just one person is involved, but God is only one. God didn't need a mediator. God was handling this all on his own, okay? Is the law, therefore, against the promises of God? <clears throat> Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, righteousness would actually have been by means of law. There's no life in the law. You must accept this and realize it. There's moral, there's moral protection that can help you morally to understand what's right and wrong. But if you cross that line and think that law is putting you in right stand with God, you will unravel. And it may not look like this on the surface, but behind closed doors, my gosh. But the scripture handed all things over to the custody of sin so that the promise resulting from faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those exercising faith. There's a good little trick, isn't there? A good little trick. <laughs> um, that the promise might be given to those exercising faith. Now, it's gone right back to what Paul's argument's trying to stop. 
If you're exercising faith, then you get given the promise. No, that's not it at all. That's not it at all. It's not your exercising of faith that gives you the promise. It's See, Jesus is the author and finisher of your faith. You've got to separate your faith that you have within you to the faith he's put within you. It's not your effort. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. You have your faith and you have the faith that Christ put in you. If you start relying too much on your faith or at all on your faith and don't surrender to what Christ has done, you're back where this all started. That was a clever little trick by the translators there, but you've got to be careful for that, isn't it? Because it, everything that's just been said could be unraveled in that little three-word passage. Those exercising faith. Well, let me take it one step further. If you are exercising your faith, all it has to be is in the finished work of Christ. It's not to get you on side with Jehovah. It's just exercising your faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Gee, they're clever when they try and deceive people, aren't they? Because you could be sitting in your chair reading this and then all of a sudden you're up out of your chair. No, 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 no. However, before the faith arrived, we were being guarded under law, being handed over into custody, looking to the faith that was about to be revealed. And that faith was in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the law became our guardian leading to Christ, so that we might be declared righteous through faith. Just let me check this asterisk. Oh, it doesn't really take you anywhere. Oh, down here. Okay, let's see if we can find the asterisk for this. Three. Let's just bear with me, viewers. I know it's a little bit of a pain, but what do we got? Where's that asterisk? What verse are we in? 20-something. 23 or 4. Let's see. 20... 25. So where's that asterisk? Our tutor. That's what I'm looking for. 24. See, guardian and tutor are two different things. A guardian can be a neutral person that just tries to guard you. But a tutor is someone that actually teaches you. Okay, it's a bit of a hard word. Um, I'll give them 10 points for putting tutor in the footnotes. Um, but if we go back now, it's, um, so the law became a tutor that was where it should have been wearing these people out so that when Christ came, they've gone, thank God you're here. But it's so binding and blinding, as you'll see with the Jehovah Witnesses who can't get out, don't even know they're in it, in a bad place. It's so binding and blinding that it, it just, you're unable to see Christ. It's a miracle to know Christ for who he is, I'll tell you this. But now that the faith has arrived, we are no longer under a guardian. There's no need anymore to try and make God happy or stop him from being sad. Just believe in Christ. You are all, in fact, sons of God, through your faith in Christ Jesus. Now Paul's hotting up now because he's moved from saying you're a son of Abraham, which can really um, become an idol in itself, to saying you're actually sons of God. You're sons of God through faith. In Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now I just want to ask you Jehovah Witnesses, when you were baptized, were you consciously within your mind being baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ and everything that he's done or into the Watchtower organization? Because from what I hear from a lot of ex-Jehovah Witnesses, being baptized into their organization is the beginning of the end. Instead of being the end with a new beginning. Being baptized into Christ is putting yourself down into the water and leaving your old self behind and all your efforts and everything else. You're acknowledging that you're dead. So that he can live through you. But when you're baptized into the Watchtower organization, as far as I'm understanding, is instead of dying, they make you, they, they're leaving you alive to try and do everything you can to make Jehovah happy or stop him from being sad. 
There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor freeman. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in union with Christ Jesus. Moreover, if you belong to Christ, you are really Abraham's offspring, heirs with reference to a promise. Now, I don't know what heirs with reference to a promise is, but it's heirs according to the promise. What's this say? Let's see if we can find this. Um, verse 29. Seed. Yeah, okay, fair enough. But you're as according to the promise, not with reference to a promise. You have the promise and everything that comes with it right now in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you enjoyed that. It's 1.46pm Eastern Standard Time, New South Wales, Australia. This is Dr. Jason W. Morrison, Theologist. Bye for now. Yeah, Dr. Jason Morrison, Theologist again. I just want to say thank you for watching the videos and I uh, hope you got plenty of uh, self-rediscovery and freedom out of it. If you watched it on YouTube, please share or like. Um, maybe even comment. If you watched it on Facebook, like, comment, share. Um, but most of all, get out and live. This isn't a rehearsal. You've got a one-off life. Don't let your loyalty and your faithfulness blind you to the life that you should be experiencing. Till the next video, thank you for watching and bye for now.